Welcome to Slash Forward. For Thanksgiving, I usually like to provide a movie recap that harkens back to warm memories of breaking bread with kith and kin. You know, family stuff. And I refuse to break that tradition. So I'm bringing another installment of family-focused horror. And I have to say, this movie is wet. I'm referring to the 2003 Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake, starring Jessica Biel. When a group of friends and acquaintances pick up a shell-shocked hitchhiker out on a county road, their plans of traveling to Dallas for a Skinner concert are confounded by her sudden unexpected demise. Stuck not knowing what to do or where to turn for help, they try their absolute best to follow the instructions they're given and extricate themselves from this very sticky and moist situation. Unfortunately, almost everyone they meet along the way are in some way connected, either by community or by blood, and have a tremendous disdain for outsiders and the sanctity of human life. Given that, and given the necessity of keeping Big Tom Hewitt occupied with various crafting projects, lest he get bored and turn to the community to find the bits and pieces he needs, the story leaves us on the edge of our seats, wondering when they'll all figure out how much trouble they're actually in, and if they'll do so with enough time and space to give them even a chance at surviving. Be sure to leave a comment with your thoughts on how this remake stacks up against the original. And while you're here learning about homicidal hill folk, be sure to check out some of my other videos from the subgenre. Let's get to it. We open on some high grain documentary footage, with a very serious voiceover explaining we're about to witness the abject nightmare of five nubile young adults. We start our story with the police evidence walkthrough of the Hewitt residence, and listen as this primordial vlogger carefully describes everything he sees. We then transition to the aforementioned nubile young skanks, wallowing in the stank of their summer vibes. Morgan manages to put an end to Andy and Pepper's fun by recounting fun facts and trivia about the prevalence of STDs. Not to be outdone on the buzzkill front, when they pass their marijuana on a cigarette, Erin tosses their bud right out the window. This is when she finds out they're returning from their Mexican vacation with a two-pound brick of hash stowed away in the vehicle. Kemper has speared her ire when they nearly hit a nearly comatose woman wandering the county road. When they try to address her, she just mumbles something about needing to get away and wanting to go home. Erin ushers her back into the van so they can provide assistance. If anything's going to bring down the vibes, it's this. The gang just sits around and gawks as she stutters about everyone being dead and whatnot. And then she freaks out when she sees her going back the way she came, which is where she says the bad man is located. They're not really picking up on the signals here, so she reaches into who knows where and gently withdraws a snub-nosed surprise. Then she shows them all something they've surely never seen before. Now the whole gang is overcome with a case of the willies, and they hop out to shake it off. But what do they do next? Well, you can't call the popo when you're hauling a stash like what they got, but Kemper is looking for ways to get back in good with his lady. So he tosses their fully loaded pinata into the tall grass and goes to see what Aaron thought about that thing he did. Did she see it? When they drive off again, they're exhibiting something more akin now to winter vibes, I suppose. Except they're all so, so very sweaty. They pull up to the local gas station meat market and ask the proprietor to call the police for them. While the boys peruse her fine goods, and the girls locate the toilet that time forgot. She confirms the sheriff wants to meet them at the old Crawford Mill. An unusual request, but they do do things different out in the country. Rather than let their cargo ripen for the next two hours, they comply with the request. But they beat them there, and are feeling antsy about relieving themselves of the corpse. The boys band together and vote to dump and run, despite Aaron's dagger eyes. But this plan is waylaid when they walk the property and catch some movement in the mill. Aaron both doesn't believe them and decides to go snooping about. They don't find much other than a grumpy old possum and a young lad who appears to have taken up residence here. Jedediah is somewhat of an aficionado of demonic iconography and is also a friend of the sheriff, who he says is at home drinking. Rather than waiting around for him to sleep it off, they vote to proactively seek out his assistance. And soon, Aaron and Kemper are hiking the beautiful wilderness that is also riddled with the toiletries of the damned. Back at the mill, they try to keep that sick freak from prodding and probing the body, and he ends up running all the way away. While out at the house, after knocking in an overhead fashion, they meet the homeowner who says the sheriff doesn't live there, 
However, he does have a phone they can use. However, his only house rules are wipe your feet and ladies only. She's able to get through to the station and is told the sheriff should be at the mill in about 30 minutes. Before she leaves, she's called back to help old Monty with his colostomy bag. She then tries to get him in his chair, but is lifting with her back and getting groped at the same time. Meanwhile, Kemper enters the residence to see what's taken so long. He searches all around and ends up finding a sick charm bracelet, but he pays a terrible price in the finding. When the heavy door slams, it alerts Aaron that there's potential trouble lurking in this house. She does a little bit of searching around inside, but when Kemper fails to answer, she goes off to search elsewhere. While all this was going down, the sheriff had already rolled up to the mill, where he made a dominant first impression. He listens to their story and looks around at the evidence, expressing some surprise that the runaway had a gun, before slipping it back into its holster. Getting right down to business, he enlists Andy's help in hoisting up the young honey so he can wrap her up in cellophane, making some fairly lewd comments the whole time. Once the oozing has been contained, they lift her out of the van and transition her to the cruiser. The sheriff then bids them farewell and safe travels. Aaron continues searching for Kemper on her way back toward the mill, but we see that he's actually back at the house and in the process of getting pieced out for various art and home decor projects. When Aaron makes it back, she shares expectations about the sheriff's arrival, only to find that he's already been there and that Kemper has not arrived ahead of her. They all walk around to look for him, following the sound of a car horn that seems to have been recently rigged up to garner their attention. They don't find him, but they do find little bits of people, as well as a mysterious hole, from which Morgan extracts a mason jar with their dead hitchhiker's photo in it, along with a family photo of indeterminate origin. Erin does have the van keys, tightly secured in her tiny pockets, but there's a 50-50 split on whether they should just cut their losses and leave. So she and Andy go to search for Kemper while the others stay behind. When they reach the fortress, Aaron does a little garden flirting to distract the homeowner while Andy slips in to search around. He finds the tanning room where they make their jerky, fingers a little blood dish, and then makes a huge mess that blows their cover. Now that the cat's out of the bag, they come clean in their intentions, but they get no cooperation. Instead, old Monty bangs on the floorboards, summoning his boy who bursts in with his chainsaw at the ready, and they proceed to play the chainsaw games of our youth. Unfortunately for Andy, it was linen day, so he has a hard time navigating his way out of there. The sun blindness takes hold, resulting in his leg getting trimmed off at the knee. Pursuant to this, he is hauled back to the project room. Aaron makes it back to the mill after dark, while the others are busy spit shining the van. She tries unsuccessfully to get her started, and is relieved when help finally arrives. She quickly finds that the sheriff has no patience for fairy tales about murder, especially when there's pot being smoked. The gang quickly finds themselves kissing the dirt, while the sheriff continues to search for contraband. He goes about his business completely impervious to their insistence that there are murders afoot. We're gonna die, we're gonna die. We're Yes, that is very likely. He then lets Morgan up to help him reenact the awful incident. Meanwhile, Leatherface makes it back to his crafting station. Since he already has a few projects going, he gets Andy hooked up and then salts his stump for preservation and wraps it up like a T-bone. He had been working on getting a new mask ready for obvious reasons. Back at the crime scene, the sheriff feels the angles are off and insists Morgan show him more accurately. Viscera be damned, but as they work through step by step, Morgan's account just doesn't seem to match up to the evidence. But his constant pressure to go further eventually breaks Morgan's brain, and he ends up drawing down on the lawman. Unfortunately, the girls both start screaming at him from outside, split on whether or not it would be appropriate to squeeze off around. In the end, the gun wasn't properly loaded anyway, and Morgan finds himself getting dragged off for punishment. As they drive back, the sheriff calls someone over to the mill to address the survivors. Morgan then tries to buy his freedom with some Skinner tickets, but gets bottled instead. When they arrive at their destination, he finds the sheriff was taking him to not the station. Morgan then gets the boots before being forced into the house. Back at the mill, Aaron is working furiously to hotwire the van, a holdover from her prior life of delinquency. She eventually gets it sparked up, but then finds out someone done stole their lug nuts. Then Thomas arrives, slicing up the van while decked out in his sweet new face. He manages to clip Pepper on the shoulder blade, allowing him to finish her off. Aaron then finds herself staring into the eyes of her lover. This should be a relief, but she takes off into the woods instead. She stumbles upon an RV in which she attempts to take refuge. The ladies that live here calmly welcome her in and offer her some hot tea. They're not worried about any danger, comfortable in the knowledge that that poor sweet boy knows better than to go messing about in the local community. Aaron accidentally wakes the baby, so Molly goes to soothe it with some Bush's baked beans. 
Aaron looks around and finds a copy of the family photo that had been placed in that mason jar. Then, the phone they claimed not to have begins ringing. She confronts Henrietta about the matter of the phone and what she presumes to be a stolen baby, but then finds herself getting a bit wobbly. She wakes up sometime later to the sheriff dousing her with beer. We learn that they harbor some resentment that her kind tends to look down upon and ridicule their boy. After failing to shut up, she gets tossed into the cold, damp basement. Here, she reunites with Andy as his tootsies gently tickle the ivories. Try as they might, Aaron is unable to hoist him off the meat hook on her own. Given the alternative, Andy asks her to just go ahead and finish the job. She wavers on this, but he does manage to goad her into it. Aaron then finds Morgan with a hole in his back, taking a tubby. Once he gets up and moving again, Jedediah comes to lead them out, having turned sweet on Aaron due to her kind eyes. And since Thomas doesn't know about cutting the corner, they're able to make it into open air. They stumble through the car graveyard, finding shelter in a shack in the woods. But he sees them go in there, so as he cuts his way in, they look for a rear exit. Feeling that, Aaron stuffs Morgan into a closet, and then scurries into a little hole in the wall where she makes friends with the rats who already live there. Their vocal dissatisfaction eventually gives her away, but before she gets a chance to check if the coast is clear, she gets a big old bear hug from behind. Morgan attempts to intervene on the lady's behalf, but Leatherface is a beefer, and he never fails to find a hook somewhere nearby. He then runs his chainsaw from groin to gullet. Aaron then takes off through the fields and uses her stature as an advantage here, resulting in Thomas snagging himself on the barbed wire fence and opening up his leg meat. She finds a passing motorist, but they're a local, and unwilling to interfere in the natural process underway here. She instead goes to hide in the slaughterhouse, one of the safest places around, but also the one place with which he is intimately familiar. She ducks into the walk-in cooler and attempts to hide amidst the beef flanks, but he flushes her out and then hits the sprinklers to further impede her escape. In an unexpected twist, Aaron gets angry and decides to alert him to her presence. He eventually comes upon a locker that's moving, and he whips it open, only to find a little piglet, allowing her to come from behind and use her cleaver to hew his arm. He retrieves his chainy, but there's really Really, no way he's going to be able to get it started now. When Aaron runs out, she finds a non-local motorist willing to stop for her. As he ushers her into the cab and drives along, she begins to babble incoherently about everyone being dead and wanting to go home. And when she sees they're going in the wrong direction, she begins to freak out. Despite her warnings, he pulls up to the market so he can ask someone for help. Aaron uses this opportunity to sneak up to the window and keep an eye out for an opening to counter steal the stolen baby. We then see her attempting to do a hot wire as the sheriff approaches the truck. While he's fiddling with the dark cab, it's revealed that she's actually stealing his cruiser, which she then uses to smear him all over the road. She even takes the extra measure of backing up so she can roll over him again. Then, on her way out, she gets a final farewell from Leatherface. What a sportsman. This brings us back to the evidence video made during the investigation of this event. As they carefully venture into the improperly secured crime scene, they learn what it costs to intrude on Mr. Hewitt's territory. And ya boy was never found. I believe this installment is widely regarded as one of the better remakes out there, with a subset of fans who favor it over the original. Much like the updated version of The Hills Have Eyes, I think this film went far in regards to updating a classic movie for modern audiences. It gives a lot without solely focusing on gross outs and gore, builds up tons of tension, and presents a level of grittiness that is hard to match. With that said, I'm not sure I would put it ahead of the original or the sequel. The original two present a chaotic surrealism that is unsettling and incredibly hard to replicate. Even with the comedy elements introduced in the 1986 sequel, it leaves the viewer feeling unnerved. I'm not sure that can be beat, but this remake gets about as close as anyone's likely to get. And in the context of modern horror, it is excellent. Before we go, I'd like to give a huge thanks to my donors, memorialized in the Hall of Headshots. I have a website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch. Any donation unlocks a growing collection of uncensored movie recaps. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.